Okay. Hey, my Lobos. So I have to read chapter 20 again because for some reason it only recorded 11 seconds. So now I have to do the whole thing again, um, which I didn't realize until I was just trying to like put on your homework, you know, that I was like, hmm, 11 seconds for a chapter. Anyways, chapter 20. That week unspooled slowly with hot days and muggy, breathless nights. Militia units from the surrounding colonies piled into the city. Ordinary folks skedaddled out of it as fast as their horse or feet could carry them. The extra soldiers were not the cleanliest sort, or maybe they were just too busy drilling and making gunpowder cartridges to wash. Whatever the cause, New York soon smelled like a garbage pit mixed with a, mount a fresh mountain of manure. The stench cooked under the midsummer sun. Madam's mood changed with the tide. One moment she was floating on clouds of fancy, imagining her grand life once the British beat the rebels. Next, she, was fe she fell into melancholy, grumbling about the lazy British commanders floating at anchor off Staten Island, observing New York through long spyglasses, but making no move to invade. She now carried with her a brocade pouch suspended from a red satin cord. Within the pouch lay a green flask filled with a calming elixir prescribed by the doctor. He advised her to drink from it whenever the need arose. She also took to wake, walking around the house in her stocking feet, trying to catch her, trying to catch me unawares as I scrubbed or dusted or polished. Often with Ruth at my side, she said nothing during these encounters, but watched us with ink, with hungry hawk eyes. It unnerved me. Why do you think she's watching them? What is she looking to catch Isabel doing, or Ruth, or Ruth doing, for that matter? The week after Hickey's hanging, Becky offered a mild attack. Becky suffered a mild attack of the ague that had befallen so many soldiers. She grew pale and sweaty, but did not require purging or leeches. In her stead, I went to the market. Our needs were fewer now that we no longer fed the master and his companions. Twas a good thing, for farmers were feared to come into the city and there was less to choose from. Many people fled every day, including the wives of General Washington and Colonel Knox and the Brigadier Green. Her that folks said was a big flirt. I searched for Curzon every day, but Bellingham's affairs kept him out of sight. I was afraid to seek out Colonel Reagan, afraid that word would get back to Madame and our lives would be put in jeopardy. Ten days after the British flooded the river with their ships, news that the Congress had declared independence arrived in New York. The declaration was read to keep troops from, from the steps of City Hall. The men cheered so loud it seemed to shake the whole island. I hurried from the egg cellar to see the cause of the commotion. The cheering men danced and marched down Broadway, tossing their hats into the air and shouting across the river at the silent ships of England. They gather, gathered into a mob at the Bowling Green, around the massive statue of George III. I stayed at the edge of the crowd, hoping for a glimpse of Curzon or a, a soldier from my visit to the battery. The king was mounted on his horse and the horse mounted on a white marble pedestal that rose to the height of three men standing one on top of the other. Both the horse and the man were fashioned larger than could be possible, but I suppose that was the way of kings. They were both made of gold that sometimes glittered in the sunlight, but dulled when the clouds interfered. Ropes appeared as if conjured, thick ropes used for tying ships to the docks. The men cheered louder and worked together to throw the ropes over the king and his horse and tie them tightly. One, two, three, heave. One, two, three, heave. The men strained their arms and backs. Boys on the edge of the crowd jumped up and down. Common folks stood froze at the sight of a king being pulled down by the strength of the men working together. One, two, three, heave! The statue toppled slowly at first, then gaining speed as the weight fell from the sky to the ground. The men scrambled out of the way, no one wishing to be crushed by the fallen king. As it crashed, they shouted even louder and swarmed over the thing. Axes were called for and rushed out of workshops and up to the barracks. A half dozen men took to chopping the king and his steed into bits. I inched closer. How could they be chopping 
threw a statue with simple axes. A piece of tail broke off and a soldier held it up for all to see. The king was not made of gold, but of soft lead covered with gilt paint. The crowd shouted again as another soldier lifted the king's head freshly removed from his neck. A fife and drum corps started playing just beyond the mob, piping out the song usually heard during a tar and feathering party. The men made short work of King George. When the statue was reduced into pieces that could be easily carted off, they did just that. The plan was to melt down the lead into bullets. We'll fire majesty at the redcoats, shouted a man with a booming voice. I, said his companion, shouldered an axe. Emanations from the leaden George will make deep impressions on the enemy. As the crowd marched off to make bullets and celebrate liberty and independence in the taverns, I realized dark was fast falling. I had tarried overly long. I picked up a silver, a sliver of lead that lay on the street. It was fringed with guilt. My own piece of majesty. Tyrants beware. I thought as I put it in my pocket. I was surprised to see the front parlor windows alight when I walked down Wall Street. Is the master back? I asked Becky. She was dozing in the chair by the kitchen fire when a red checked shawl around with a red checked shawl around her shoulder her shoulders, still worn down from her illness. Becky yawned and stretched. Far from it. Madam paid a call to the Reverend's wife after supper, came home with high color in her cheeks and a bee in her bonnet. Dress the child, she says. Make sure both the girls eat something nourishing and sweet. Did she fall and hit her head? I asked, setting down the basket of eggs. Becky laughed. I think the Mrs. Reverend served her a dose of scripture, the hard kind, Madam says. It's been too, I've been too harsh on my servants. I must mend my ways or the Lord will punish me. I was confuddled. She was being kind to Ruth again. Becky stood slowly, wincing from the aches in her bones. Surely so. Ruth lit up with like a, ladder, a lantern when she saw them fancy clothes again. Promised to be quiet as ever. Made short work of the gingerbread Madam baked too. This was too much. I sat down at the table. Madam baked? She's a fair hand in the kitchen when she puts her mind to it. Left the dishes for yours truly, but the cake was tasty. Those two pieces are from you. She was, she was most firm about it. She stopped to cough up what sounded like a large wet worm from her throat. She cooked up sweet milk for you too with nutmeg, cinnamon, and sugar. Said you was to have some with your gingerbread. I sniffed the pitcher. It smelled good enough. Did you have any? Not with this cough. Milk would stop up my lungs. I looked around the kitchen. Where's Ruth now? Becky unpinned her apron and folded it and tied on her bonnet, preparing to go home. Madam got it in her head to play cards this eve. Has two companions in with, in with her. The Mrs. Drinkwater and her daughter. The one who who's to marry some sort of lord or duke or some such. Ruth is in with them. She was right cheered after the cake and milk. Should I take anything in? I just come from there. Madam was most definite. Tell Sal to enjoy her cake, enjoy her cake and night off. She was work she has worked hard these weeks and could do with a good night's sleep. She called me Sal instead of girl, I asked. Are you full certain she didn't hit her head today? Becky laughed and the laugh caught in her throat and bubbled into a cough. Look here. She's likely to turn back into a sour old cow by breakfast. So so I say, have a good sit down and enjoy your little enjoy a little piece. I poured a mug of the milk. Huzzah for the reverend's wife. I wanted to savor the gingerbread bite by bite and sip the milk slowly, but I couldn't help myself. The mug was drained and the plate empty soon after Becky left. The milk was the sweetest thing I had ever tasted. The spices so thick that I could near chew them. No wonder Ruth was cheered by it. I washed up my dishes, tidied the kitchen, and found myself with idle hands. A rare event indeed. I might could sneak into the library and borrow that Crusoe book. I could read by the fire with mending basket nearby and slip the book into into should madam approach that seemed a fine plan but first i wanted to shed my bodice it pinched something awful under my arms i felt my way down the cellar stairs with my shoes and heard the sound of laughter from madame's company i yawned when would they leave and what sort of ladies come to call this late I removed my bodice and hung it on a nail. The palette shook soothing and cool. The palette looked soothing and cool, and the thought of climbing the stairs again made me weary. But I would like to read a few more pages. But I was overly fatigued. But Mr. Crusoe was facing all sorts of dangers. But in between one thought and the next, I fell asleep. For that, I should never forgive myself.
So all of a sudden, Madame is being like super nice. All of a sudden, she wants to offer cake and and spiced milk to um, Isabel. Um, but there's always something going on with Madame. So I think Isabel was a little too trusting. 